Recordings. Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to another virtual video with Casey. Hi, good morning, Antoine. Good morning. Good morning. I think everyone's in. There we go. Hi. Good morning. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. How are you? Good. Good. All right. <laughs> So normally um, what I do is like as soon as I hit record I just kind of like rush in and immediately start it and I'm like kind of bouncing back and forth between talking and letting people in but from now on I think we're just going to, well I'm going to just kind of like slow it down, show um, for the first few minutes of our meetups. Um, if you can hear, I have some nice uh, lo-fi beats going on as we all come into a meeting today. So I will say um, today's meetup is going to be each of us sharing our ADOS story. Um, basically how we resonate with ADOS, how we um, became introduced to it, how we first started on our journey, our, um, our uh, introduction to reparations and American descendants of slavery. So we'll each have um, a turn and the way I'm going to do it is from my end, I don't know if you can see it, how I can see it, but um, in this view, um, we'll start with the first person, the first being Antoine, and then Deb, and then Alvania, I hope I'm saying that right, Alvania, and then Brian, and then me. So we're just gonna hang out for a few more moments to see if anyone else is going to join us. And other than that, yep. So, uh, does anyone want to start off, like, uh, share how your week has gone so far? Of course. <laughs> Yeah. Also, um, just so it's, it's, it's easier to have the dialogue, if we could all add our, our face so we can all see who we're talking to, that would be great. Just because it's kind of, um, I mean, just for me personally, it's a little bit weird not to see the face of the person whose voice I hear. So if you're at a place to, um, to make your your face or, or uh, change your settings to show your face, that would be amazingly great. Thank you. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it is. I think it is 9, 10, so then it's time. So like I said, today um, we'll each go around and share our idea story. Um, let's um, just get started. Um, we'll start with you, Antoine. Hi everybody, my name is Antoine Winter. I'm a member of the ADOS KCC group. I'm also writing candidate for United States 
it's pretty it, it's pretty. Um my ADO story. Well my first racism I was probably like 10 or 11 years old. I was uh, walking through so many corners with my aunt. There was a white couple walking towards us and the man had aggressively bumped my aunt while we walked past. So I stopped, turned around, said, excuse me. The man had, the man berated her and I was a young child. I didn't know why he was berating her. He ended up calling her a boy, you know, because of her short haircut. He ended up calling her a boy, you know, and he was looking at us. Uh, I was with my uh, younger cousin and we were both like about nine or eight years old. And then here, here we are standing with our aunt and this white man was berating our auntie and I didn't know why, you know, at that time and I was so young. And I can't forget, you know, looking into that woman's face and, you know, wondering why she was letting a man talk to a lady like that. You know, that's when I realized, uh, you know, it was because I was different to them. We were different to them. We weren't awarded the same respect because we were black. And so that's when I knew that I was different. And that's when I knew that African descendants of slaves were looked at different than other people. Because I, I, look, I learned it from a young age. Before then, I was full of Man, the world was just open. You know what I mean? I could do no wrong or nothing. And then when that happened, and I realized right then, at a young age, that I would always be looked at different. I wasn't uh, equal to these people. They would always look at me different. They would always look at me in some disregard. So I've been ADOs for a while. And I've known I've been ADOs for a while. Um, what resonates me with this group? Because when a people have had their whole identity stripped from them, systematically stripped from them, when they have been broken like horses by clinical psychologists, they need to rebuild their culture and their pride. And they need to do that with black nationalism and collaboration with their brethren. And that's what brought me to the ADOS group because we need this. We need this fraternity between African descendants of slaves. We need to build a new culture, a new pride in what we are because we can't run from it. We have to embrace it and we have to nurture it. And that's the only way that we're gonna get anywhere. And that's what brought me to this group because I'm not running away from my ancestry. I'm embracing it. And that's why I'm here. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you for sharing, Anton. All right, and Deb, you are next. And also you're a new face, so if you wanna introduce yourself first and, um, and then share your idea or story, we'd appreciate that. Deb, we can't hear you. Are you connected to the audio? Uh, hold on. Did you? Uh, we still can't hear you. Is your volume up? Um, oh, okay, well, I guess, um, let's see if we can get her back, if she'll join back in, but, um, 
I think she said she was going to dial back in and hang out. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, Alvonia, Alvonia, I want to say that. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. But you're also a new face. So if you want to take a moment to introduce yourselves. And then Alvonia. And Deb Ellis is my sister. And um, basically, I'm new to this. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm just ready to learn. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Deb was able to get the website, the 80s101.com, and she told me to take a look at it. My personal experience, um, I'm an avid book reader, and I was fascinated with Gone with the Wind, and I read the book maybe seven Gray, and I was just blown away with the antebellum South. And um, then one day it dawned on me that, you know, if I lived during that period, I wouldn't have been Scarlett O'Hara. I would have been Mammy. So then I started reading a, about a lot of Black history, um, just reading a lot of books um, about um, African Americans, U.S. history, and um, again, I'm just fascinated with ADOS, and I'm here to learn and listen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Alhamdulillah. All right. Brian, do you want to share your story? Yeah, for sure. Um, can you hear me all right? Okay, good. Yeah, and this headset's a little funky, so... Um, my story is, of course, different than everyone else um, for the obvious reason. But I guess um, I what drew me what drew me here is Kiara's Twitter handle first and foremost. I never heard of the notion of ADOS. Um, I think uh, you know I've been interested in the concept of reparations for probably about 10 years, um, right around when I was in the midst of going to law, going through law school. Um, I'd heard the, heard the concept, but never really, you know, speaking honestly, like never really thought too much about it beyond, you know, the notions of fairness and thinking like, yeah, that, that seems pretty fair. But because it's, you know, again, doesn't immediately affect my day-to-day -day life, particularly when I was younger, um, I didn't really dig into it too much. So, um, you know, I, I saw Kiara's, well, I started following Kiara through just like local politics on Twitter. And then, you know, many of her, um, much of her content on Twitter involved reparations. And of course the handle says ADOS. So, so that, that really intrigued me about it. And when she mentioned, you know, this weekly meeting group, I really jumped at it because I, I think the, the concept is really, really important, not just for economic reasons, of course, but as Antoine said, like cultural rebuilding and, and reestablishing the culture in this country is really the only way to justice, I, in my opinion. So um, I'm really, really fascinated by the concept. I really want to listen. Um, uh, and I've also been doing a lot of, a lot of, uh, homework and investigation on the notions of economic justice and fairness. And I don't think that we can get to economic justice without reparations. So um, I've got the, the uh, From Here to Equality book through the library and been like slowly reading through that. <laughs> As you know, it's pretty dense. So I, I'm really excited to just listen and, and hear everybody's stories. So thanks. I'm glad to have you here. And I'm glad to have a Caucasian male here. I mean, it speaks a lot. It that, that speaks a lot. And one thing that I like is, you know, I mean, I understand how hard it is as a white male to be introspective in times like this. So I appreciate you, Brian, for being here. And and thanks. Thank, thank, thank you, Antoine. I, I should say, actually, I started following Antoine before anybody else. And he's got a, <laughs> he's got a great Twitter handle, and um, yeah, yeah. So thank you, I appreciate that. 
All right, so um, ladies and gentlemen, I'll catch you up on all the, um, you've been following along through um, messages in like the private Twitter uh, chat. So, you know, it's like today we're sharing our ADOS story, um, how we came to learn about ADOS and reparations and how we, um, how it resonates with us and basically how we uh, came to where we are today. So, um, Leighton, you're up. If you want to share your story, that would be amazing. Hey, outdoors. Good morning, good morning, uh, my people. Um, where would I start? Uh, so, I guess I can start here. So, I'm originally from Louisiana. You know, I, I've been here a lot. I've been here probably like six or seven years. Um, I'm a country boy. I grew up, you know, pigs, chickens, cows, you know, real small city. Uh, it's probably like 17,000 people. The average, um, I think the average salary in my hometown is I made like $21,000. Like, you ain't worth nothing. But um, I guess my journey started, you know, just coming up poor. Like, you know, you're trying to figure out how to make it. I know a big goal of mine was leaving my hometown and never coming back. Like, it was no opportunity there. Um, a lot of what we talk about in the show, like an over-policed community, like I get pulled over every week, literally. Like when I went home, I had a couple of COVID deaths, and I went home and got pulled over four times. So that's just, you know, that's a part of life. Then. And so, um, you know, I guess my journey started there. So when I left, you know, I really started using the internet for what it's supposed to be used for, you know, more than Facebook. Hey, Layton, I'm sorry. I'm going to uh, jump in real quick. Um, if it, if everyone else can mute themselves, because we're getting a little bit of feedback. Just so, um, all right. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, just uh, left there. Uh, I went to Louisiana Tech. I got my degree in electrical engineering. Um, I left, you know, and just kind of started searching for life, seriously. And um, we're sending a lot of money home. I don't know if y'all are familiar with the black tax. Like, you know, when you're the one in the family that get a good job, everybody and their mama asks you for money, you're supposed to pay it because, you know, that's what we do. And um, I, I just, you know, I was able to do a lot. But, you know, looking long term, it was like, yo, I'm not going to be able to take care of everybody forever. You know, I still don't have no kids. Like, I want to have kids. I want to have a family. And it's like, I, you know, I don't got enough to take care of them and me. You know, so you know, I started with Boyce Watkins. You know, he teaches a lot about finances. Me and Boyce told me we left, and that's actually how I found him. And uh, I've been watching the show for years. It's been about four or five years now. You know, and having these conversations. Uh, I I know some of the guys are here last week. Uh, I'm on the Slack forum here in Kansas City with some people that run for elected office, some people that have won elected office, and we exchange political ideas. And I'll be honest with y'all, everybody thinks we're Russian. Well, not everybody. They think we're Russian. They think we're not real. They don't think we've done any work, no matter how many facts and charts and no matter how much I show them, it's still, oh, you guys are Russian and you don't matter. And I think now is a great time to be a part of ADOS because I, I can't speak for everyone else. But over, I figure like the past year or so, from a national perspective, I see national media speaking a lot of what we were speaking about like a year or two ago. And it's like, oh, that, it, it's coming. It's kind of slow, but it's coming around. Everybody's talking about reparations. Now people are talking about a black agenda. And we've done all the work in that area. As far as you know, all the work with Sandy Garrity, you know, I have a couple of his books I'm trying to read. Like, it's just been a journey. Um, I And I have to say, you know, and I want to take this time out to say, I'm Really excited to see you guys here today. Like, I've been screaming ADOS from the top of the mountain for about five, six years now, and it seemed like what nobody listened. And it's like, no, I know this is right. I know this is fix our problems. Like, I know this is it. And then, you know, I started thinking about, like, why is nobody accepting this? But then I think about Mark, Malcolm and Mark. Nobody liked them niggas when they was alive. You know, like, it wasn't like everybody was, you know, on the Martin and on the Malcolm train. Like, it, it wasn't like that. And so, you know, for me, it's just, you know, I go about it, I read, I try to educate, and I want to do my part. You know, me and Gary talk about that all the time. Like, I'm willing to do what needs to be done. I'm a real hands in the mud type of fella. So if we got to pass our flyers, you know, as long as everything's corona safe, if we 
passing out flyers to advocate in different places. You know, I'll drop my Twitter and Instagram and all those handles, you know, in the in the chat. So if you guys are ever in a conversation or you're trying to have a conversation and need more information, like I can rattle off ADOS data off the top of my head. Like I got basically all of it committed to me. So I'm just excited to be here in this space. Um I think we're gonna have to change it. You know, they always say the revolution's not gonna be televised, and I believe that, you know, and I'm a real big advocate and you know, we got off a plantation. Like, you know, I don't think people understand how hard that is to do. So I don't feel like it's nothing we can't do. Like it's only a matter of what we come together and choose to do. And that's probably been the hardest part of the journey is trying to get trying to get black people to fight for themselves. Because that's basically all we're doing. Like we're advocating for us and only us, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, and we're all that. So just trying to, you know, get them to under getting us to understand and fight for ourselves. And be unapologetic about it. Like it's always funny to me when people talk about what well, their other poor people. I don't care about those poor people. Those poor people are okay. We've been poor for 400 years. And we're not poor for the same reasons. So it's it's a lot of you know, it's a lot behind it. But like I say, I'm 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 excited to have you guys here. I'm excited for the new faces. I'm sorry I was late. I had a long night last night. But um I'm I'm excited about it. So I think you know it's just time to put our feet in the street and get it done. That's how I look at it. All right, Layton, thank you for sharing. Okay, Deb, if you want to share your story of ADOS, uh, let me know if you're ready. I am ready. Hello, I am Deborah Ellis. My Twitter handle is Deb Dirty Looks, and it's literal. <laughs> um, pretty much like everyone else, I was actually blessed to be born in ADOS. Um, my first experience to let me solidify what ADOS was and what you guys represent, I was about five. Um, when I started school, it was 76, the bicentennial year, so I'll be 50 this year. And I had a lot of gatekeepers in education. Um, didn't know what it meant at the time, but now that I'm, you know, a half a century, I know exactly what it is. I can identify it. I challenge it. Um, in my professional life, I do have an MSW. Uh, I did attend as an undergraduate at HCBU, Lincoln University. And even there, um, I how can I put it? I understood then that was my experience with Boo and Boule and people that wanted to um, set themselves aside. So I, ha I have had a life experience to see it from all different angles. So I like to represent the forgotten vo voices of the hood. Um, I don't live in the hood. I did live in the hood. I wasn't born there. I was born very stable. But what happened was regenerification happened. So although I was born into what they call black middle class, because my parents were the generations prior to the baby boomers, and they were literally in their 30s when they had us. Um, you know, the way the laws are designed, we definitely became a statistic. I basically became of age during Ronald Reagan and the crack era. Even though it didn't affect me personally, that was just because I was too young because what that did was, that changed the entire dynamic and paradigm of black middle class, of those parents that were able to benefit from the civil rights era. So I live in St. Louis. Um, back when I was growing up, we had all of the major car makers. We had the TWA hub. We had the Ozark hub. Um, black middle class was thriving. At this point, it's kind of like killed or be killed. It was bad prior to COVID. I have been a social worker social worker my entire adult life and I know what systemic racism looks look like. Initially when I started as a young social worker, all of my um supervisors were kind of like middle aged and had life experience. Um, by the time I became to be middle aged, our generation, we were not embraced. I turned around and had 30 year olds as 
uh, supervisors. And not only were their life experience was not good enough, they were not culturally competent. So by the time Mike Brown happened, I was working for an organization here in St. Louis called Gray Circle. And they allowed young white women to go over and deal with Ferguson. So all we had was art therapy type of thing. So, I mean, it has always been right in your face, but because of how our ethnicity is always discounted for a lack of a better word, we kind of get what we get and we stay all over the place. So I have always been ADOS just to know the title of it, even in different spaces with different types of black people. Um, I feel uncomfortable because I'm a leader. Uh, I am in a sorority. Uh, me, myself personally, I have never felt obligated to go see young women join a sorority. That's a whole different conversation. But as black people, we have to get it. Nobody is coming to save us. The NAACP, the Eastern Stars, the uh, Masons, the Deltas, the Qs, they, they have lost their sight on what we were founded for. So we have to do for self. So I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy that my spiritual journey led, led me to ADOS. I do have my book. I was blessed to get two of them a couple of months ago. I didn't know they were a rare commodity. Um, I'm blessed to have two kids. I have one that's about 30 and one that's 15. Um, my son was the first person to tell me that my political stance was outdated. Uh, my mom was a loyal Democrat. The Democrats did do a lot for her generation. She was also an election judge for the Democrat Party. But this is not her party. You know, the Democrats do take us absolutely for granted. I'm just tired. Um, when I'm on Twitter, I don't even try to be gra grammatically correct. Because pretty much, I work in it every day. Um, I have worked in environments where Black people knew it was wrong, and they telling me to be quiet. Here come Deb. So, I mean, I graduated from Lincoln University. I went there twice um, because things happen. So, I have a, a long life experience. I'm very educated. I am so blessed to have a mother from Mississippi, both sides. Um, my dad from Missouri, but his family was not stable at all. They were migrant sharecroppers. Um, I lived a good life, but I know that all of the advantages that they tell you education brings you is a lie. Um, I have made good money. I did work in academia, but it was for a proprietary college. Um, that's where I got introduced in, into the whole Pan-Africanism and how it doesn't work for us. I thought my story was actually a unique story. I had the opportunity to work with a um, female from Africa, but you know with the Africans, they are very ambiguous about where they are actually from. They get away with saying I'm from a continent and never narrow down the country. And I also worked with a um, second generation Haitian, which was a male. And this was during the time of Obama. Um, with the Haitian male, basically, I was harassed to the point that I had to um, talk to my husband about it. My husband is also second generation middle class. His experience is totally different from mine. My experience came from um, my parents buying a house in a place that it was a lot of black middle class period that came in the 60s but his was actually after the like the mid 70s so it was 76. where we live now florissant is kind of somewhat an affluent neighborhood that's just like ferguson they want you to think ferguson was somewhere in the city no ferguson have has million dollar houses so it's a lot of games that get played in st louis because of we have municipalities as well as the city and I'm sorry, I could just go down different black holes just to discuss the games that they play with us as ADOs. From where we buy houses, my mother was uh, regentrified and basically her house was blighted. 
um, to bring back a supermarket in a desert. So, I mean, it was a lot of games to be played. I could talk about the subprime housing and how that got my mom. So I'm, I just believe me, myself individually, yeah, I'm okay. But when I start thinking about the generational wealth, the state of our entire community and how the United States is directly responsible for it from the school system, and that's a whole nother discussion about our school system. Our school system dates back with lineage, but our school system is hollowed out totally in St. Louis City. So it's just a, a lot of things that Ados has glued and fused together for me that I could just run with it all day and just say, okay, here's a good example of that. And it shuts them down. So um, I really thank Ados for bringing it all in perspective, even from healthcare and how we are often, um, uh, I don't even know what you call it. Uh, we are beyond being tested on. They, my husband, for instance, that's a good example. He has never drank or smoked, but he had a heart attack. A couple of days prior to him having a heart attack, we went to the hospital. They went down the whole little black checklist. Do you smoke? No, never smoke. Do you drink? No, I never I think Deb's computer or laptop just froze. Oh, well. Well, she was in the middle of, like, I was, like, so in girls. I hope she, um, she gets back. I don't want to, like, cut her off, so. We'll just give her a moment to see if she comes back. But um, yeah, it's, it's, um, let's talk about what we've been discussing so far. I mean, everyone has shared such amazing um, experiences with being black in America and with, um, in everyone's case, with um, experiencing what it is to want to be a part of the change that needs to happen. So let's talk about that so far. Um, in what ways, in what ways, um, now that we're all engrossed in ADOS life and reparations advocacy, um, how has that changed our perspective? Let's talk about that. Okay, I, I'll jump in since nobody else did. Go ahead, Antoine. One way that it has changed my perspective, and a lot of people have talked about it, is black flight. It's the reason why I'm still in the city. It's the reason why I'm still in the middle of what people call the hood. Because we can't look for anybody to save us, and we can't blame everybody. The same way Caucasians ran away from the cities when we moved in. We're doing the same thing, running out to Ferguson, or if it's in Kansas City, it's Grandview, or Raytown, or Lee Summit. That's what changed my perspective. You got and people talk a lot about equity. Equity is giving a hell about where you at. And how can you talk about the plight of your people and the plight of the city when your ass run out to the suburbs. And that's why I'm here. And that's one way it changed my perspective because I'm gonna be here because I'm not gonna talk about my, the plight of my people and talk about the plight of the inner city and then run my ass out to the suburbs and pay taxes to something that don't even benefit my people. That's one thing that we have to do. We, start, we gotta stop running away from the cities because right now they gentrifying them cities and turning them in only white only places. And that's one thing I don't ever hear anybody talk about on here is the way we running away from the cities, the best minds, the best thinkers of us run. And then we wanna get on Twitter and everywhere else and talk about how bad it is for us. But we don't stay there and put equity into the city. And that's why I, I don't, 
I don't, I take it with a grain of salt. All these black people that want to talk about our cause and our plight, and they don't stay nowhere near us. And that, that's, that's where it changed my perspective. Thanks for that, Antoine. Okay, so Deb is back. If you want to um, finish up or uh, continue on your story. Are you ready, Deb? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, no, I'm just saying I just have a different take on it. I've dedicated my life to social work. Um, I'm thankful for my education, even though I probably, my common sense probably would have gotten me a better advantage in life because I'm basically top heavy as far as student loans because I do have an MSW. Um, I just think it's all a racket when it comes to black people. I saw someone say, you know, first we pick cotton, now we are cotton. People profit off our death and our life. Um, I pay a lot more in taxes. My school district in the suburbs aren't any better. Um, basically, Ados kind of solidified a lot of things. Uh, I do have a 15-year-old. Um, she was in the public schools, and it, public school is not like it was back in the 80s. So I don't accept when adults are not doing their job. So what I mean by the school system is we get a lot of people that comes from like the rural areas or different states to teach in the urban areas to get their student loans paid. The same with the police department. I mean, if you are not a stakeholder in a community, which I'm a stakeholder in the ADOS community, um, I wear myself, I wear my things with pride. I have never allowed myself to be disconnected. That's why I have never really fully embraced, um, how can I put it, uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, those type of things. Because really, it's rigged. Uh, not only do I have a bachelor's, I have a master's, my son as well, um, but it's not designed for us to follow the same footsteps as mainstream society. It's, it's education for us can be an anchor. Um, probably if I wasn't married, I probably wouldn't own a home anywhere. Um, I have close friends that have a lot of student loans. It messes with your rate to income ratio. I have a lot of friends that didn't go to school and did jobs that were more um, manual that did fairly well back in the 90s. So I like the way that ADOS is able to say, hey, uh, Racism is indoctrinated into society, which it, which it is. Um, when I was a very young woman, I, worked, I did mental health. So because I did do mental health, I was able to see those generation of kids that they started to diagnose with um, ADD and ADHD. And I find it amazing that now that they are adults, those are the very drugs that they are abusing. When we as parents kind of tried to sway a lot of them away from it. And I'm making all these points to say, we are tone deaf with what these kids need. And these kids are rejecting us, even my generation. I feel like my generation passed down twerking. That was the only thing we passed down. Um, they need help and I support them. And I'm moving out the way because I believe in Ado. I think this is a young person's movement. I totally admire our tone and event for even being able to put a thought together because it's hard to navigate through. All I knew was something was wrong. And the spaces that I was in, we were the ones that were supposed to facilitate some type of change. But instead, I would have to show up at people's houses and basically tell them, this is how the system works and it's bullshit, but I'm part of it. So, as ADOS, I feel like we are stuck. So regardless of where we live, we are still part of it. We, we are still part of the process. We can deny it and say, well, it doesn't affect me because I can go less than five miles away from my home in a different car and be pulled over by the police. Where I live, I don't even see the police. So 
Okay. I'm sorry, y'all. I got visitors. So that's all I have to say. And thanks, y'all, for giving me the opportunity to even talk. I'm just here to learn. Um, I love and respect everybody's paradigm. I'm just ready to really get educated because how I was educated was a lie. And I totally rejected. And I just feel kind of embraced by ADOS and all of the history and all of the research that's being done. I admire you guys. And hopefully when I get my new glasses, my things won't be so grammatically incorrect. But I'm for real here for the unheard voices because um, Mr. Wendell can teach you a lot for lack of a better word, if you guys remember that song, Mr. Wendell, you know, so I'm embracing everything, but when it comes to some extra bulls, excuse my language, extra bullshit, like the culture wars or the color wars, or even the things with the black men, I'm not with none of that. I'm for, I'm for us moving forward. There's nothing that has to do with any of our reparations. So, Hopefully, I'm politically correct in this form, but I'm just saying how I feel. No, that's fine. I think um, with ADOS, I think, you know, being PC or non-PC doesn't make that much of a difference. It's, it's the fact that we need to be truthful. So, um, as I'll share mine now, my... ADOS story, um, it almost, it's, it happened through uh, an unusual uh, cer set of circumstances. Um, um, I don't know, where should I start? Uh, I'll start with um, a few years ago, um, actually more than a few years ago at this point, I think it was about um, five years ago, I went from uh, being married and being a stay-at-home wife and mother to having to uh, figure out how to navigate life as a single mom, uh, a single black mom. And so we moved into an apartment. Um, it was it was the first time I'd ever lived by myself, and it was the first time I'd ever um, lived well not by myself. Well, my daughter was with me, but um, it's the first time I'd ever like really been on my own. Like I've gone from you know being uh, a daughter living with my mom to being married and and being a wife and a mother. So this is um, so there's a lot, a lot of uh, transitions that happen in my life all at once. So we moved into an apartment, and we lived there for about um, almost five years before we were evicted. And the reason why we were evicted is because. Uh, we, it was a house that we were renting, and the owner of the house decided uh, he wanted to sell it. We we were um, in the West Court area of Midtown, and um, as you know, there's I, I, it, there's a ton of, of desertification that's happening in the West Court area. I would um, it used to be predominantly like local businesses. I don't even know. If, I haven't been in West Point in so long. I don't even know if we can say that anymore. So with all the changes that were happening in the neighborhood, the owner of the house um, sees some opportunity to, um, I guess, uh, sell. And the new owners decided that they didn't want renters anymore. I'm not sure what they were going to do with the house, but um, the people who were there, me and my daughter, and there was um, a couple who were in the apartment below us, and then um, a gentleman who was above us. We're all we all had to leave. I I never I never heard of that before. Of you know we you know I I paid my rent on time. Like I I, I was never any trouble at all in the apartment. So. 
to be to be told that we were we were basically being thrown out of our home because this is what we made our home to be for the past five years and for there to be nothing that we could do about it. It's just that's just how it was. Like I like I I tried to fight it just to see if the new homeowner would, you know, reconsider or or something along those lines, but uh, to no avail. So we basically had to leave. And it was really uh, devastating because, like I said, that was, you know, it was just such a shock. This was, you know, I was a single mom and I was scared about, you know, not having a home, not being able to find something else right away. And somewhere in the midst of um, trying to fight the eviction and also trying to um, get a new place to live, I stumbled across um, Yvette's videos on YouTube. And I didn't watch them at first because, um, as I said before, they were really long, but eventually I just started watching them. And her message just made sense. I remember the one that really sticks out to me is where she says, you know, Black America or Black and U.S. have to eat the failures of America. And that really resonates with me because it makes me think, like, I... I had to eat that failure, you know, Westport, the Westport Midtown area in Kansas City is being gentrified, and I have to suffer the consequences of that. Me and my daughter, we were, we were the ones who were affected by um, being thrown out of our home. And because of that, I, I, um, I stumbled across a KC tenant. And that's when I realized, like, oh, this this is happening all over. Like, it's not just us. Like, this is this is an issue with um, Black Americans in Kansas City across the board, across the United States. And because of that, I just I just started watching more videos, and eventually I started um, reading articles and. Uh, following AVOS on Twitter and just reading about what they talk about, what they post, and it all just makes sense. Um, I grew up middle class. Um, my mom, she 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 retired from um, a nice uh, local government job. Uh, she worked she worked at City Hall. And I uh, grew up in the suburbs of Raytown. Um, our school was mixed. So growing up, I, um, like my mom, she was, she's, um, I was raised in a single parent household as well. She raised us with an awareness of being black. But I will, I will say it was in a way, an awareness that's closer to what we think of as um, black excellence, you know, we, we put our, you know, she took us, I mean, uh, she's an authority as well, and, um, I think a lot of her, her networking with, with the authority kind of benefited us in a way that, you know, she took us to, you know, all types of, like, black soirees, and, Pat, she was heavily involved in um, the pageant world of, um, of her authority, aka it's her authority. So that was our experience. We saw a lot of very fancy black people. Like that was our experience. It wasn't it. Um, so it wasn't necessary. Um, it wasn't necessarily that we were unaware of, you know, the, the issues in the black community. We just didn't experience them. 
And that's that, the pretty part of it. Yes. That's the very pretty part of it. I you know, like I said, I I knew what I was joining when I went into it. Um, but that's the pretty part of it. My my daughter as well has been exposed to Delta, yes. but I'm afraid for her. Because at this point, like with my chapter, they will accept no offense, but they will accept a white girl before they'll accept one of our daughters. Which is which is strange because my, my sister, she's a legacy. She she um she's also AKA and in fact um her, my mom, and my sister both went to Lincoln too. So uh -huh. so it's kind of so it, it's 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 kind of uh nuanced in a way, like because um because now I'm constantly talking about how all the issues of Black America affect us the most. Yet at the same time, they up, up, up until uh, a few years ago, they didn't affect me. So it's kind of like I didn't see it until I saw it. You know, my mom. Yeah. It's designed that way. It's designed for us to feel um, like there isn't a case system, like we are actually a part of the American fabric, and we're not. Yes. yes. I mean, I'm not doing any better than my friends in the worst zip code. It's just that I'm not exposed to it every day, but it exists. Exactly. So I think with, with that perspective, um, sometimes like it, it took me you know, a little, a little bit to have to grapple with, okay, so what, I mean, I don't want to say that, you know, I think I'm privileged in, in a way, because I'm not, you know, in a, in a, in a grand scheme of what American privilege, what the majorities privilege looks like, I'm far from that. But it does, but growing up the way I did does give me sort of a, an advantage to be able to come from where I came from, yet still resonate with the issues of the black community. Like even though I didn't experience them until I was older in the, until I was in my um, early 30s. I still like, like I said, it just, it just makes sense. The way that, um, the way that Azette and Tone and Be The Power, the way that ADOS Online construct their posts, once you hear the information, I mean, just for me personally, I was like, oh, so this is why this happened to me. And, and Kiara, like, um, like the legacy for like where I went to school at, we have to talk to people about, well, why didn't you send your kid to, you know, to our, to our beloved school, basically. And, you know, we'll send our kids to the Mizzou that has always historically been raised. We're okay with that. You know, I have friends now saying, well, my daughter going to, uh, I don't know, wherever. And I'm just like, why won't you try uh, HCBU? Because I would not have any education had I not experienced that as my first education or higher education. If, if you guys can follow what I'm saying, you know, a lot of people, we, we, we think integration was a good thing you know but i see integration in the way that you know a lot of resources left our community yeah because a couple of times our doors are almost closed and it's like we all fall in line the same way we do with um with um like we did with the obamas you know we just all like yeah you know they are right they did it but they didn't yeah, so, I mean, I mean we all got. Part of it is yeah. us trying to do better and act, not acknowledging that there, is, that there are laws and policies on the books 
that kind of put us in the same box. If that makes sense. Now, I'm back to now. We're able to do oh, I can't hear somebody. They weren't able to do then. We're able to look at, okay, this this particular piece of policy was supposed to be for us. Like if we're talking about affirmative action or if we're talking about something to that effect. And we can draw a line now and say, well, this didn't work for us. Black home ownership didn't go up. Black income didn't go up. None of these policies work. We weren't able to do that before now. But now that we can look at those policies and say, no, if we want to be affected, we're going to need to be, we're going to need to be identified specifically in policy. We're going to need that policy to say ADOS, that needs to go specifically towards us. Because when you couple us with people of color, when you couple us with minorities, when you couple us with all these other groups, none of the resources ever get to the Ferguson's, as you were talking about. Like, those resources never get to those places. Because because of the way the policy and the legislation is written, and I'm not able to make that case, but I'm on an issue that I find a lot, specifically with people here in Kansas City. And I gotta be honest with y'all, these motherfuckers boggle my mind up here. Like I never understand their perspective. Like coming from a certain place, like you say, if some of us have different backgrounds. Some of us grew up in middle class neighborhoods. I did not. I grew up in a very poor neighborhood. And the one thing that I found when I get to the position that I'm in now, when I'm in these corporate boardrooms, I was telling you guys, I'm an electrical engineer. I also work for Evergy. So, you know, working for one of the biggest, bigger companies in the city, as well as, you know, I work for the Barnes and McDonald's. I work for all the top tier engineering companies. Like, the people that are here, or the people that are in those spaces, they don't advocate for people like us. Like, even the people that look like us, that you think, oh, well, they're black like me. They don't, they don't care. Like, either they, they can't relate, or you know, like, like Dad was talking about earlier, there are these bootstrappers, there are these do for selfers. It's like, well, you can make it because I made it. Like, no, nigga, it don't work like that. Like, they don't, people don't make it from where I'm from. Like, I don't know anybody who's done remotely anything that I've done in terms of going to college, graduating, going out to get a, 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 you know, a job with a, a really reputable company. Like, that type of thing doesn't happen. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm very aggressive, not only in my tone, not only in my speech, not only in my advocacy, because like Deb was saying, we have to be the voice for the people that can't talk, because most of our communities are, I don't want to say that they're politically ignorant, they don't have a political education, they don't have, they don't know how politics work, and so we have to explain that to them, and at the same time, we have to fight these people that, you know, and these people I kind of converse with on the regular. They're all about doing things the way we have been doing. And what I found out is like, that don't work. Look at where we are right now. We've been doing it like that for 400 years. That's not going to work. Peace smuggling isn't going to work. Getting us comfortable with other people isn't going to work. We have to have transformative politics. We have to get reparations and we have to get it now. Because if we don't get these reparations before this, um, before the 64th trillion dollar, what is it, the wealth transfer is happening? If we don't get it before then, it's over. Everybody's going to be homeless. And I think we're going to get a good look at that here in the next upcoming months because I don't know if they read. And, if they read and, you, are, and you are absolutely right. Um, what they're doing to the baby boomers and the greatest generation is they are getting their property, but they're getting it off of kind of like what Ke Kiara was saying. My mom property was taken, and it was taken by a community service organization where they are building new homes and grocery stores, but the people don't actually own the land. The land is being leased. So sure. they are still taking advantage of um, that generation that was able to make a generational uh, advancement, for lack of a better word. But our parents' generation wasn't able to necessarily pass anything down. And that's, I think that's why, you know, getting the reparations is so important. Because, like, I got, actually, I got in this argument last week. Um, I was speaking with a, a couple ladies on this forum that I'm, I'm on pretty, pretty, pretty regularly. And, like, she included her parents, because I told her the baby boomers are dying and they're transferring that, they're running down to the younger generation. And she was like, well, our parents are baby boomers too. But your mom ain't got a money. Your mama ain't passing you down and, there. And even if they had $100,000 in their portfolio as far as um, stocks and bonds, the stock market is not working. 
Trump they probably Trump don't even have that any. I mean, anyway, the, the the black middle class is delusional. That's who you yeah. have to argue with. The people that <laughs> feel like they have. I still meet with black. I still meet with black people that are first generation high school graduates. Wow. Like that's crazy. I just wanna, I just wanna jump in real quick and say that when you, that when we talk about the wealth transfer that's about to happen, I think we need to understand what that means and what that's. It's it's not, it's not that maybe that uh, boomers in are are passing away. I mean, it's not just that that they're leaving the inheritance to their children. It's it's the government bailouts that are happening now. Because what's happening with these bailouts is that you know corporations are getting billions of dollars. Their CEOs are getting a raise or bonuses. That money is transferred into their household. That money is passed down to their children. So right now, the government is providing these corporate CEOs with a, with a means of passing down generational wealth to their children. Right now, at our, on, our, on our dime. So I think with that, you know, it's kind of hard. Like I guess, like I am amongst my peers, um, you know, we're we're young black millennials. We come from households where our parents, you know, they had good jobs. They 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 own their own homes. They they took us on vacations. We you know we we are traveled. You know, we're we're educated. I went to private schools. Some of us, it's uh, not uh, uh, the better public schools. So it's really hard to. It's really hard to uh, or explain to Black Americans now that it's it's really a delusion that we're that you know we're we're not as well off as we think we are compared to white wealth. You know, a, a lot of the opportunity that we have for generational wealth were plundered. Don't you think the delusion rock us to sleep at night? Oh, absolutely. You know, we, yeah, we don't want to, we don't, yeah, we don't want to admit that there's a problem. You know, we, we, we have our good jobs, we get our paychecks, and we just, we just don't want to see it. Like to interject and make a comment. Um, again, I'm Alvonia, and my Twitter handle is bookfly2x80. And um, I have three grown sons, and I was I live in St. Louis. Um, my sons are very dear to me. Um, I have a lot of access access to a lot of young black males. Um, and for me, when Ferguson started. Um, we saw it, everything transpire live. Um, I'm here because um, when Deb, again, Deb is my sister, when she um, told me to check out the website, I went in a skeptic and came out a believer. Um, the information was just so profound. Um, but for me, I think um, we really don't know as a people who we are. Um, everything is so fragmented. Um, so with that being said, um, and I think back, it was my son, my oldest son, he's 32. He was the one that told me that we were delusional as far as the status of the political party. He always spoke out about what did Obama do for us? And um, and this is during um, his when he was still in office, and um, he explained to me how we romanticize the idea of a black president that we elected him just because he's black, with an expectation for him to do something, and he never um, he never paid on the debt. 
And I, um, I, I really don't think didn't. we had that expectation. That's my sister, y'all, so I can interrupt her. <laughs> I don't think we even had an expectation. I was just waiting on him to say, they killing us, stop it. Yeah. That's all I wanted him to say, that they yes. were killing us. Ferguson I mean, was where we are from, we had we had the murder all rate is so high for generations that we were not allowed to that we were not allowed to go to. We had oh, sections of the city that we were not allowed to go to. Period. So I mean, Obama, we we had the lowest bar for him, and he couldn't feel it. I was gonna say, Brian, did you want to add something? You were like you had something to say. Uh, I love this conversation. It's really refreshing to hear it and, and heart heartening to hear it because well, I agree with it all so far, but I just, two quick points. Um, I think that the economic discussion is really the foundation of all of this, which is, you know, why I think reparations is so important. And also, I, I mean, I won't speak for an entire, you know, uh heterogeneous group of white people but the white middle class is just as delusional as the black middle class in so many ways different ways but but just as delusional so and i think leighton had leighton had wanted to jump in too so i just wanted to speak on um you know what deb and alvani was saying about our uh, expectations for obama and I, you know, that's what, something I tell a lot of people when we have the discussion about ADOS. I always tell them that our first goal, and this is from what I see, you know, our first goal is always to educate the people. You know, understand, like, what does this mean to have a black president? Or what, what is that, what, what, should you, what should your expectation be? Because basically, you know, if I can sum it up, politics is about distribution of resources. So let's just consider it as a big pie. And in this pie, is a, a, a set given amount of resources. What politics does, it cuts that pie into a slice and gives a slice to a given community. That's all politics is. It's distribution of those resources. And I think one of the issues we had with Obama, while you know we like to see him dancing to Al Green, you know, I always tell people, I feel like the only reason we voted for Obama was because of Michelle. Because when you see that brother with a suspect man, you feel some type of way. And that's something we speak on a lot called uh, identity politics. Because basically they say, oh, well, he looks like me. He has a black wife. He got black kids. He listen to Avery. He play basketball. That's a nigga. Like, he know what I'm going through. No, he don't. He don't know nothing about your life. Like, nothing at all. He didn't grow up like you. He didn't experience the same things you experienced. His life is not your life. And that's, you know, one of the arguments that I have with people all the time. Because they tell us, well, why doesn't Ados push your candidate? back? And that's when we go into the finances. Well, we have to compete with Walmarts. We have to compete with the Coke brand. We have to compete with Microsoft and, and Amazon. And we don't have the money to compete with these people because we're poor. So we have to push the agenda. And I think that's kind of a big point of what Alex is about is, no, if I elect you, you need to be doing something for me, regardless of what color you are. Now, it's a total different story when we say, because I'm from the South, and you know, I'm pretty sure my folks is probably a little different than some people's folks. But our folks is like, okay, well, we got a black president. What does that mean? Your neighborhood is still messed up. You're still looking for a job. You still don't have no money. You still finna get evicted. All of these things are still happening. It don't do no good to have him sitting in the White House and he can't do nothing for you. And that's my point that I push. I don't care what they look like. I need a black agenda. I need it specifically for ADOS people. And I need it just the way we wrote it up. Because that's the only thing that's going to fix it. It ain't no if, ands, or buts. It ain't no if we do this. No, this is what we need. This is when we need it. And we're going to need this, this, this multi generational policy for the next 400 years and possibly further after that. that. That is no conversation. I argue with people a lot about that when it comes to HR 40, because everybody talks about HR 40. Well, they voted for HR 40. HR 40 only studies reparations. We did that work already. We don't need to study it no more. We have the, the leading social economist in the nation, William Sandy Daly. He's we've done all the work. We just need you to implement. It. And we need black people to understand why defunding the police isn't important when it comes to reparation. Because there's a section in reparation that has to do with police reform. When it talks about student loan forgiveness, 
only 30% of all black people even go to college. So passing a policy like that is going to help white people more than it's going to help our community. But if you get reparations, we can essentially solve the majority of our problems with one stroke of the pen. So we just got to educate the people and we got to understand it don't matter if it ain't no black people in Congress. I wouldn't personally care, personally, as long as we have the laws and the legislation that's being executed the way it's supposed to be. Because a lot of times what you're coming to find out once you do the resources, the Sheila Jackson Lees, the James Clyburns, um, that's all over there. And I won't really need a term. But a lot of these people that we look up to in politics that, that share our skin tone are not advocating to help our communities. So we gotta get rid of them. We, we got to get them out. And that's the issue I have with a lot of political heads here in Kansas City is because they, they, which is really funny to me, they say, well, he's just gone. He's too far gone. He's radical. He's Russian. No, what happened to me was radical. Enslaving people for 400 years and locking them up in mass incarceration and shooting radioactive waste and giving them syphilis, that's radical. So you can't fix a radical issue with a conservative answer. It's not going to work. And that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to address these issues with stuff like, you know, like all of the little policies they give us, like that, that bullshit program Obama had, my brother's keeper, whatever happened to that. We heard about that after he got elected, but there was no budget tied to it. And so that's what ADOS has done over the years, is taking all of those policies, taking all of that legislation, and says, okay, this work, this doesn't work, this is how it's got to be, this is, this is what's going to put us to where we need to be and continue that going forward. So we just got to get into the knowledge and I think we're doing the most important thing that we can do right now in this moment. We're sharing our experiences and we're, we're, we're coalescing around the problems in our communities and we have a path to go forward. And now we just got to spread that. That's all it's about spreading because I feel like something that speaks a lot of that, that I actually you know, agree with 100% is having a critical mass. So I want to know. Go ahead. I want to know from you guys what would what can we do to get Josh Harley up out of there? I'm so sick of him. <laughs> and Roy, well, Roy Blunt is ours, but Josh Harley from y'all end of the state. What can we do to get him up out of there? I think we got to well, well, I have a quick, I have a, a quick question to go along with that. So we talk about, so we talk about identity politics. How when Obama was in office, we saw him as a, a shiny black man he had that beautiful black family and and that's what we wanted it's you, you're seeing it now with how how the nation is how the nation of uh black american is mourning um chadwick boseman said you know he was but he was black panther we saw in that character what we want to aspire to ourselves that's what we also saw in the Obamas. They were a beautiful black family and we wanted to see that for ourselves. We we see it in Kamala now. You know, she's she's aka sister girl and we resonate with that. So with all that in mind, how like uh, what what Deb was just asking, how best can we change that narrative to get our people and when I say our people, I mean our our family, our friends, because they're, those are our people. So brand new, including this show. When I say family, friends, I just, how how can we convince you know those closest to us that democracy as it is isn't working? Like it can't, we can't continue to run on the same, and we do have to work to. Hold our local politicians, our Mayor Lucas, our Josh Hart, um, Hartley, our um, our Governor Parson. Um, what what can we do? Like what like what are we what are we doing now that works? You know, I mean, because we're all here for a reason, because we heard the message and believed us. So how do, we, how do we share that message with others? I, like I want, think honest, if we can get people um, to be honest about their own financial picture, again, the biggest um, deterrence to everyone, no one wants to be honest. Most people that make six, six figures, um, they spend most of their money. There isn't any wealth. Once you can convince people 
to move out that bubble and that fallacy and fantasy that they live in. Look, you're living hand to mouth. There isn't any wealth. You're only worth what you have saved in the bank. You know, and tone, you know, tone and even they're showing us the stats, what we are worth, really. We have no wealth. You know, um, I was exposed to Claude Anderson um, and a lot of the readings that, you know, we all done collectively, we're blown away that wealth hasn't changed since 1865. You know, tell a black person they're no dumbfounded because they say that's the, we, we, would, we would just let out of slavery. That's the point. You know, we don't own anything in this country. We never have. Deb and I always would say, you know what? Uh, at first we picked cotton, now we're the cotton. Now we're being picked. So that's just my stance. Again, Black America, you know, Brian pointed out that, you know, white America too is just as delusional. And I think now that everybody's suffering in this country, um, I think, again, the best time for the movement as far as our local politics, I just want to celebrate the fact that Lacey Clay is out of office. Um, you know, he was there on, you know, you guys spoke about legacy. And um, I'm so glad he's gone. You know, he rolled in on the, um, he rolled on the, the, the victories of his dad. You know, um, he did a lot for labor and stuff in St. Louis, got a lot of jobs open for blacks in the 70s, you know. Um, labor work, good paying jobs, but Lacey, he's done nothing. When Ferguson kicked off, he never even came back to St. Louis. Um, I, myself, and my sons, we participated in the protest, stuff like that, but it's just profound to me how Missouri local politics is so warped. It's like, I don't even feel like I'm getting representation on the local, state, or federal level. And uh, me being a black woman, you know, um, it's just so profound. And as far as Kamala Harris, she does not represent me. I'm not falling for that sister girl mess. I know she's a bombing Indian of the highest hierarchy and they believe in caste systems. And guess what? They don't like black, dark skinned Muslims like me, okay? She's a known racist. I don't feel comfortable with the Biden or Harris ticket. I really don't. And especially being a mother, three black young men who lives in St. Louis where the death rate is what, 67.1? It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And that's all I have. Thank you for listening. All right, Antoine, did you want to say something? Well, uh, you were asking the question, how do we give the youth, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we let people know, how do we let the ADOS community know that politics as usual isn't working? Well, one thing we can do is we can give our people someone else to depend on other than the government. Because right now, a lot of our population, that's all they have to depend on is the government. And a lot of that is because of black flight. Because the best of us run. We're not there to help our neighbors. We need to give our community someone else to depend on besides the government. And the only way we can do that is by being there for them. And, and, all, and we need to be where the help is. You know, blocks couldn't get gentrified now, I'm not talking about the houses where people got their houses took. I'm talking about the houses where people's, uh, well, well, where they would rather rent it out for Section 8 and let some people tear it up than stay in it themselves because they don't want to stay Antoine, in it. Antoine, that's up to the housing mortgages and stuff. Like no, I'm talking, I'm talking, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not talking about people then they got their houses took. It's people that uh, it's people's people's that own houses here, and they won't even stay in them because they in the inner city. They'd rather oh, rent them okay. out for Section Eight. You know what I mean? That's what I'm talking about, and I'm talking about these five hundred thousand okay. dollar homes and and million dollar homes right down the street from me that don't nobody black want to buy, but a white couple will come in there and move in it and fix it up. 
You know what I mean? That's what I'm talking I, about. Now, we see, need to the, talk about black flight. We cannot nah, run away that's from the black part. flight. We need to talk about black flight. No, nah, you can't, you can't say, say that we well, there for our that, people like what I'm from miles away. We cannot say that. You cannot say that and mean it. If you're there for your people, you there. You can't be there for your people oh, from far away. You can't be there for your people from far away. You got to be where the help is needed. And we need to give our people something to depend on and hope. And when they see the what, best of what us I'm, running, they what don't I'm give them no hope. You, well, they say, we go, this you, is a caste system. This is a caste well, system and well, crawl I'm dads trying, in a bucket. Ask, one of them will crawl over the other one to get up. Now we can say we care about our people all we want, but you care from afar don't mean nothing. Okay, you can well, sing well, together. Uh, you can't uh, talk together. Uh, what, and I and then I'm on what I was referring to was the actual mortgages that they don't allow us to have in our community. When I tried, when I tried to buy my house this second time, where I was from. Number one, either the houses were really overpriced because where they was located, or either they was on that other side of the border, like the other side of the train tracks, where they wouldn't even give me a mortgage to move there. And I didn't have the cash to buy it. So I kind of got um, redlined into a neighborhood. But I know I needed somewhere to live for it by, like, to pay apartment rent. That didn't make sense. So, I mean, I'm still like in the, I'm in the area. So I don't think you're talking about me personally, but I just think the way they got the housing market set up, uh, they lock a lot of us out. If we live in hand to mouth, I mean, I got a lot of people that get evicted a lot because I do senior services. And I think what they do in our community, they leave our houses to die like they leave us. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Mr. Scott, you can go ahead. I just wanted clarity from Antoine. Hey, no, it's cool. Um, I did want to take a moment real quick to say um, I dropped my Twitter and face all my handles in the chat as well as my phone number. I think we should all do that so, you know, we can follow each other, not just when we meet up on Saturdays. Uh, I want to say that first. Secondly, I wanted to uh, kind of comment on, comment on what Antoine was saying because, one, I love your passion, brother, and we know we all get passionate about this, and I don't think anybody's offended in any way. But I do, I know for myself personally, when, when someone's speaking, I throw my finger up because I want to interject, but at the same time, I'm trying to be, you know, calm about it. So we love the passion, right? I love the passion. I love this conversation. But a couple things I did want to let you know, because I, in some ways, I feel like you're addressing me. And I know we don't know each other like super personally, but I do want to speak on it. This is a book that I would suggest to you. Uh, this is called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. This was one of the books that um, Yvette, you know, one of the books we did a book club on, and it specifically goes into detail about the realty market and equity in homes and home ownership and how black people were contagious to wealth. Because a lot of times, and I'll speak to my personal situation, when I was growing up in Louisiana, I knew I was leaving and never coming back. So in that case, I am a runner because there was no place for me to make an opportunity. But when it comes to the equity market, we have to keep in mind for a long time, specifically here in Kansas City, J.C. Nichols is mentioned in this book like 30 times. And, and I, I thought that was really interesting because it says, you know, that black people weren't able to apply for uh, federal housing for FHA loans, I think until like the 40s or something like that. And the reason why that's important, when you look at the realty market, we've only had, what, that's 40 to now is what 80 years. We've only had 80 years to take advantage of the equity market because we didn't get nationally backed loans. So there was no way for us to afford those places. And when we actually got the money to afford them, what happens was, as a black person, if a black person moves on a, on a white block, then that property value of the white block goes down. And that was before legislation was written to, to change that. After legislation was written to change that, what they did was people like J.C. Nichols, people that developed that developed these urban areas and cities and neighborhoods and, and, and subdivisions, in the underwriting, they would say, if you sell your house as a white person, if Brian was to sell his house to Kiel, Brian could be persecuted and locked up as well as losing his own. So not only could black people not buy blocks on, on white neighborhoods because they would diminish the wealth, 
But it was it was illegal because if they bought the block and a white person sold it to them, they both could go to jail. And it looks like you were saying I, I, I'm not against what you're saying because I agree, but I think it's a it's a lot more complicated than how we view it. Because it's not just a matter of staying here to help your people. Like I have to feel safe. You know what I'm saying? I want my money to run from it, or I'm gonna be poor and can't go nowhere else. So it's it's, it's real. I get what you're saying, and, and I, I agree with it, and I commend it. But I, I I don't want that to be said without knowing what our wealth values were, without knowing what the policy and legislation was behind home ownership, without knowing what happens to a black person who stays in the area. Because like uh, Dan was talking about redlining earlier, as a black person, if I have a home and it's around the community of black people, then my home will appreciate my value, like other homes will appreciate in white spaces. That needs to be corrected by the government as well. So it's all these different pieces of policy and little loopholes throughout the whole conversation that we have to pay attention to. Because I agree, we have to be there for our people, but we have to know why we aren't able to be there. Because I think there are a lot of black people in our community that would fight, but aren't fighting because they feel like, well, if I fight for my community, I can ride up on the streets. And that's very real. Let's make no mistake, the most radical thing you could do in America is fight for black people. That that's the most, there's nothing more radical in American politics than fighting, than doing what we're doing right now. And it comes with major consequences. People have had their heads shot off. Like we talk about, we say, well, you know, Martin Luther King was assassinated. It has been proven in the Supreme Court that the United States government assass assassinated Martin Luther King and his mom. That's been proven. So we, we can't say it without saying that part. They will murder you for this. This is a murderable offense by our government. So we have to keep that in mind when we talk about the people that are or aren't advocating for our community. All right, uh, did you want to jump in? Um, say something about the um, gentrification. Um, for me, um, again, Deb and I were siblings and I had the pleasure, I basically lived in the house that was gentrified for 42 years. And uh, I had the privilege of seeing an upwardly, upwardly mobile community, the effects of the crack epidemic, property values. At one point, when they first offered my mother to buy that house that they built the grocery store on, they offered her a house that was email. lower. Okay. They offered her amount that was lower than the purchase price, and she bought the house in '67. And she told them, "I bought it for ten thousand dollars in '67." But um, anyway, again, as Dale mentioned, the the people that bought the property built houses. Okay, and um, it, it was really amazing. So going back to what Antoine said about gentrification, when a community is being gentrified, what I've noticed, the, it, the, the process occurs 20 to 30 years before. First thing they do is the police. They criminalize the residents, okay? Um, it got to the point in our neighborhood, if you call the police, say you're a victim, you call the police. The first thing that they're going to do is ask you for your ID. You're like, wait a minute, I got bust up side tape, but what's your ID? Let me see your ID. And they say, oh, you got a warrant, and they'll take you off. Okay. Once the police criminalize the citizen, next thing you know, the, the people that work and have options, they're going to leave. You're not going to stay in a community that is no longer safe, especially when you have a family. So you have the working people, they're out. So what's left? You have a community that's at odds with the police. You have people leaving property and people that could rent the homes out to Section 8 or whatever. They're just trying to get their money back. And then we see the crumbling city. So when they come to regentrify, the families that originally purchased the property, remember the family don't get the inheritance. Black families don't get the inheritance for buying property. Black property depreciates. Again, um, you know, it's like my mom bought a house in 67, 
for in 1967 for ten thousand dollars when they wanted to regentrify the neighborhood in 2008 they offered her seven thousand dollars and you know my mama said you mean to tell me after 40 years my house didn't go up in value at all and all of the residents that they bought out were black people that had lived in these neighborhoods 35 40 years the older black the gifters the, the the black people that worked all them lives set money aside raised their kids so they got beat out the property again um i think we leave our neighborhoods not because we want to it's all the cycle because when they're ready to get the property the the families don't even get um uh, a good what can i get at, um a reasonable amount they come back and gentrify our cities they get all the vacant buildings they're worth nothing the city when they regentrify they pay nothing for the property opposed to for for the government or the power that be for them to buy property they don't pay full amount when it's black they take it and and uh, and again it's just the cycle that i've noticed just from observation all right, well, um, I see Chris has joined us. Welcome. Um, if you could um, make your your face visible so that we can actually see when you're um, talking, that would be great. Um, I'll make a quick point before um, you jump in. Chris, actually, sorry, Chris. But, um, so today we're sharing our idea story. And we are comfortable. We are at a little bit past the ten thirty mark, but I mean we're having a good conversation, so we're just gonna continue. Um, before we all leave out, I do want to ask us about um, the book club meeting that's coming up. So don't let me forget. But um, before Chris jumps in. I do want to say that I I agree with what I'm to leave, but I do agree with what Antoine was saying as far as black flight. I do definitely. I mean, what you all are saying is true. Like our our neighborhoods are identified. Our people are are forced out of their homes. That that is definitely true. But then you have people who, I mean, there was a post um, that everyone was talking about how, you know, I think this this black man must have been, it must have been his wedding day because he looked like he was dressed up to get married. But all of his, um, but in the post he said, you know, I've got, I've got nine best friends who are all black. You know, we all have these, like, you know, these good jobs, you know, no excuses, you know, we're not victims, blah, blah, blah. And I think a lot of us, or some of us, not a lot of us, well, yeah, um, we, we get that mindset. You know, we, we, we get to come up. And we move into the we move we move into the better neighborhoods, and we just forget about the people that we forget about where we came from. So I think with that, what Andrew was saying is like we we as a community, as a whole community, you know, from from the, the from the one percenters to the black middle class to those who were who were still in the low income neighborhoods, we all have a responsibility to each other and not all of us have uh, have taken on that role. You know, so, like he said, some of us do we, we we forget about where we came from. And for some and that does need to be explored. You know, when we have the we we see it every day and with black celebrity you know they're they're millionaires multi-millionaires billionaires and they seem to just come are completely detached from the overall experience of black america so but like i said that's not all of us but but that whole 
but that whole subset culture does exist within the black community. Those who who just you know you know they we were crabs in a barrel and they, and they managed to get their way out and they and they pulled up the and they pulled up the ladder on their way out the barrel I I guess I don't, I don't know uh, how else to say it but I definitely think um just speaking from my perspective like I like like I said I did not grow up in in uh low income housing but yeah i still resonate with that message like i get it and now that i'm older and now that i'm aware i do think it's like i have a, a responsibility to set aside whatever little privilege that i i thought i had to speak to the greater to the greater needs of all black america and I wish all black Americans had that same sense of responsibility. Okay, so now that I said all that, um, uh, like I said, we're here today sharing our ADR stories. Um, Chris, you are up. But, um, we'd love to hear from you about what resonates with you as far as um, the ADR's message and reparation and advocacy. How did you get started? Um, what made you decide to get on board with ADOS? Oh, um, okay. Uh, yeah, so I guess for me it was, um, I was following in with Antonio Moore uh, for quite a while through, um, uh, 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 what's his name? Oh, Zo Alonzo Williams. Yeah, Zoe Williams, uh, his show. He, uh, referred, he would refer to a lot of stuff that, um, Antonio Moore would uh, post up a lot on his podcast on uh, the voice of reason. And so I will follow. So through following Zoe Williams, I ended up finding out about Antonio Moore and through Antonio Moore I found out about Yvette. And so I was like, okay, let me find out who these people are and see what their message is. Message is. And from that, I was able to uh, discern like, okay, this is, I, I can get on board with what they're talking about, especially when it uh, comes to, um, I think the, the the thing that did it for Antonio for me was uh, when he was talking about how um, black people own, I think it was uh, one half of 1% of the wealth <laughs> of the, uh, of, of this country. And I was like, wow, you know, and he like, you know, broke down the, all the math to it and uh, showed the, the actual numbers. And, you know, it was just disheartening to, to look at that. But uh, so, you know, I, I don't know if y'all know, I have a podcast on Fridays that I do. And in, in our podcast a couple of weeks ago, we actually, oh, I, I did some research and uh, came across this book. Called, hey, Chris, can you yeah. share the name of your podcast? Too? Oh, yeah, sure. It's the uh, Kansas City Info Rail, the KC Info Rail. We, uh, we always go live every Friday on, um, we're live every Friday on Facebook. You can just find us by, you know, the KC Info Rail. Uh, we're also on Spotify um, and uh, Anchor. And uh, you know all of that. So, um, but but yeah. So, uh, but I came across this book called *The Color of Law* by a brother, a guy named I can't remember his first. I think it's like Richard Rubenstein. Rubenstein. Um, and in that book, basically, he was breaking down, you know, how, you know, the 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 government was basically complicit in keeping black people down. Uh, they were complicit in you know, making sure that wealth was created for a certain group of people that wasn't us um, when it came to, and, and they did say that, well, at least in that book, they did it through, uh, through real estate. And so that was uh, when they, so, um, so like, you know, I, I don't know what you all have talked about to this point. I apologize for getting in late, but, uh, but it's like, okay, so r real quick, I'll, I'll just, you know, break it down. Like when they first made the projects, the projects were for black people and white people. Um, because all black people were working together in the big cities like New York, for example. Um, so, so all the black people and white people were working together, living together, and uh, white people were coming from, you know, uh, from these small little towns and little factions in, around, in and around New York so they could come work in the factories. Black people were coming from the South to come up, to come work in these, you know, taking the bus up or whatever to come work in these uh, factories. So they made temporary housing, which ended, ended, ended up turning into um, the projects. 
So the projects used to be nice. They used to be, uh, you know, government sanctioned and, and government owned and maintained. And then I uh, can't remember when it was. I believe it was the early 1900s. But basically they said, OK, let's go ahead and create a uh, uh, or let's leave, leave basically leave the black people in the housing in the city. Let's take away the maintenance. Maintenance. Let's not give a care anymore. Let's make it. Uh, let's put up some parameters to make sure that uh, single mothers and children can go in there. With their children can go in there, but the fathers can't. Uh, let's move all the white people to the suburbs. And w while we're doing that, let's make sure that the white people who are in the suburbs and getting the housing that that they gave for, I think the houses were like ten thousand dollars at the time. Let's make sure that those houses can. Uh, I'm sorry that they're able to pass those houses on to their children and to the children's children. And let's make it illegal for them to pass it on to any black person, to rent to any black person, or to give to any black person in any sort of way, shape, or form. So, um, so, so just in doing that, and just by living or moving to the suburb, oh, and, and at the same time, they said, and let's take the businesses and move the businesses to the suburbs also. So it's like, okay, let's, you know, so all of that took place just so they could keep, well, I won't say just for, but they did that. And, and in, in essence, it created a, uh, a huge wealth gap for, you know, between white people and black people. I mean, just by doing that, um, there was a, a, a town, this town called Levittown in, uh, in New York, right outside of Albany, New York. And that town is like, <laughs> that, that was, that's a perfect example of, of what I was just talking about. And so you take that and you take that, you know, uh, extrapolate that and bring that to right now. And you say, okay, well, you know, when you hear white people say things like, well, I never had any slaves. I had no part in it. Why, why should I have to pay reparations or, or something like that? Like, dude, this is what it's about. It, like, you may not have had any sort of pay, uh, a part in it per se. Like, you may not have owned anything. Yeah, okay, sure. But guess what? The government put all sorts of things in place so you could benefit. And those are the things that we weren't able to get. Those are the things that we weren't able to do. And the government maintained a almost like a, a barrier around where we could go where we could do that you know this before redlining was a thing they redlined us anyway <laughs> you know what I'm saying when it came to uh, uh you know like if we think like right after right after uh slavery and they had the um what was it the uh uh oh what was the the the, the codes i can't remember what they called it but basically it's like you couldn't you couldn't hang around you oh god loiter is like a like they created a loitering laws so it's like we didn't have jobs and we didn't have we didn't own anything we didn't have anywhere to live we were just out and so because we didn't have any of that they were like okay take all these people and put them over here in jails but what was it black coats black coats thank you very much appreciate that but yeah so so all of that was it all of that was put into place so that way they could keep us separated from everybody else and it's just like so with all of that with all the government's actual actions that they put into maintaining a distance, a separation between white and black. Um, well, I mean, of course they do it for other ethnicities, but they really do it for white and black. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you do owe. Sorry, you do owe for this. And, and you know, I, I, I think about, you know, Dr. King, you know, in his final years, you know, he made this speech, uh, I have a dream. He died five years later. People don't realize within that five years, he was really becoming a little, you know, more woke, as a, I guess you could say, to, you know, what was actually taking place um, in the United States. And that's why he said, we're going to get, get our check. And that's why he actually got killed when he started working towards the economic base and started attacking the economic base of the United States. And so it's because of that. <laughs> for that and many other reasons that I'm like, yeah, we need to get our bread. We need, like you owe, there's a check, there is a debt that you owe. I don't have debts that, listen, I get, oh, I, I've had debts from, you know, way back when and I still get mail from and they're like, hey, you still owe. If they can do that to me, why can't we do that to the government? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's, that's what are the, well, that's, I guess, a, a quick way of me, you know, explaining what got me into ADOS and what makes me um, I'm passionate about it, uh, in that, you know, I, I know, um, uh, uh, you know, our government has, um, put, put money into organizations and into people for, who have had nothing, <laughs> uh, to do with, uh, uh, the building of this country like we had, but they have no problem giving these people bread. And it's just, it's just really weird to me that they do that. It's really weird to me and strange to me that, 
um, that happens. And when I, you know, so, so when I see it, I'm like, oh, wow. So, so that means you, you do have a heart. You do realize that you've done wrong to people, but for some reason, for somehow you can't figure out how to figure to fix things for the black people that you've wronged since you brought them here. That's, that's always been very interesting to me. Like we, you know, we can pay, uh, uh, you know, we, we can, so we can do something for, for, for Native Americans and say, okay, well, sorry for your trail of tears. Here's some casinos. We can say, uh, sorry for uh, locking up Japanese uh, people and putting them in, in internment camps, but we can give them a version of reparations. We can give money to Germany to help the rebuild Germany after they were the ones who were trying to take out the Jews, and then we can still donate money to Israel, but, and we can do all of that, but we can't do anything for Black people in America. We can give y'all affirmative action and then not even do that. So yeah, you owe. <laughs> that's the way I feel. That's the way I look at it. America owes, and they've been on, and the debt's getting bigger and bigger. If you take 40 acres and a mule and you extrapolate that over all the years that we didn't get it, man, I mean, it, it'll bankrupt this country. And I, honestly, I don't care, but you owe, and you need to get that bread up. Facts. Go back on what you're saying, Chris. Hey, well, I wanted to tell everybody uh, the book that Chris is talking about. That's the book I was just telling Antoine about. That's the exact same book. The color, yeah, the color of law, yeah, yeah. yeah I was telling them about that. And um, to go a little further on what you were saying, uh, right now we got the price, the total price marked up to I think twenty twenty one trillion dollars. Will be the That's total right. cost of everything we need. And uh, just to put it in context, when coronavirus happened, I think. The U.S. government dished out, I think it was like $13 trillion to all of the airlines and bursting companies and all the major corporations. So I don't think it would bankrupt America. They don't feel it, though. They definitely don't feel it. Well, I, 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 I think that the highest number I've heard, the lowest number I've heard was like uh, around 20 some trillion, like you said, but the highest I've heard was $151 trillion. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... That's why I'm like, well, it's, I, it's, either way, I don't care. You can pay. You, you can pay it in installments. We'll take installments. <laughs> it ain't a lump sum. Drop that bread, though, homie. Quit playing. All right, I'm gonna jump in here real quick. So we are getting to the two-hour mark of our recording. So I am gonna. Um, stop the recording now that I'm not going to stop the meeting I'm just going to stop the recording so um, if everyone here wants to uh, go around really quickly and share their Twitter handle so that way we can find you and like I said like like just just a quick little a hi I'm so and so you can find me here so we can um wrap up the recording and um yeah so i'll start so i am kira and you can find me on twitter at kira d watts um if you also want to follow ados uh casey it's it's just that it's on twitter to ados kansas City. Uh, and uh, Layton, if you want to share your Twitter handle. My bad, I was muted. Uh, so I put all my information in the chat, uh, but uh, I'm Sauce Jones on Instagram, 100 on Twitter, uh, Lucy Scudderberg on Facebook. Uh, Everything is in the chat. I also posted my number. So if anybody has any questions or wants to know any information, need a book, refer uh, a book reference or something to that effect, like I said, I'm pretty much committed all of this to me. So, yeah, um, hit me up there at any time. Like I said, I'm available. I'm with it 24 7. So, whenever it's on your mind, hit me up. All right, Dad, can you share your Twitter handle? Okay, which one will be my Twitter, Twitter handle? I don't know. I don't know which is which. Uh, just, just say both. Okay. Well, I am. Look, let me see who I am. Hold on, y'all. Some of you guys I already have. Oh, I am Sugarfoot's two times. Ados. 
and damn dirty looks. So hey, sugar, sugar is spelled S as in Sam, U as in umbrella, G as in George, and A as in Apple. And Foots is F as in Frank, O as in octopus, O as in octopus again, T as in Tom, S as in Sam, 2X, Ados, and that's me. I'm special, y'all, so please look me up. All right, Alvonia, can you share your Twitter handle? Yes, I am um, bookfly2x8 Ados at Al Be Done. And Facebook is Alvonia Creighton. And I just wanted to know, and I'm sorry Antoine had left, but I'm committed to outreach in North St. Louis. Um, I've lived there for some years in the belly of the beast. And I'm committed. Well, I, well, I was like, right now we're going around to share the Twitter handle, so. Okay, so, so I just wanted to ending, know We're not ending the meeting, we're just ending the recording. All right, okay. so Chris, can you share yours? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, find me on Twitter at uh, KC Info Rail or at Seven Blackman, S E Seven E N Blackman. All right, Brian. Yeah, I'm at, at B C Lamble, L A M B L E, on Twitter. And sorry, my, my internet's been funky all in the last like 20 minutes. So um, apologies if I'm freezing up. And um, and Anton is at Four Winters. If you want to follow him as well. So anyway, um, uh, we are here every Saturday morning. Um, the recording will be available to watch on our YouTube channel at ADOS KC later on today. And thank you so much for watching. And have a good weekend. Bye.